is Act of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hello, this is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones on the Active Worship Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I have with me uh, Stephen and Leanne Abbott. They're friends of mine. Um, it's kind of interesting how we met. Um, <laughs> I actually met Leanne before I met Stephen. Uh, we were Stephen and I were Facebook friends, and I used to do a lot of gigging in Lubbock. And um, I was at the airport flying to Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, that's where the seminary that I went to. I was located, and I looked up and saw this young lady, and I thought, man, she looks familiar. And so I, I walked up to her, and I said, hey, I, do I know you from somewhere because you look familiar? And uh, and we couldn't figure it out, and she finally said, well, my boyfriend is Stephen Abbott. I said, okay, that's where I've seen you because I've seen your pictures on Facebook, on social media. Um, and then um, Stephen and I eventually uh, played uh, maybe one or two gigs together, and so uh, uh they are living in France now. Uh, they are uh, serving the Lord over there, and I just have the privilege today of talking to them about their ministry there and the work that's going on. So, so I'm very thrilled to have them. Stephen, Leanne, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Jones. <laughs> Hello to our l- listeners. Yeah, it's such a privilege to be able to be here. Well, good. Well, um, I just want to just open it up to both of you to talk about... Um, uh, get whatever you want, really, but kind of give me an idea of what you are doing there in France, where you live, type of work you're doing, how you got involved in that, um, and then t- tell me a little bit about how, how you two met, too, like how, how that happened, because uh, Leanne is from Tucson, Arizona, and Stephen, I know you, uh, your parents are in Lubbock, but you were raised on the mission field, correct? Yes, that's right. I was born in Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Western Africa, and I spent the vast majority of my childhood overseas. In fact, it wasn't until I came here to be a student at Texas Tech University that I was really in the United States long term. Okay, cool. So, so how did y'all meet? Like, how did that come together? Tucson, Arizona, Lubbock, Texas. Like, how did y'all... Uh, come together. Well, it all starts when my mom and I got stranded in Texas, and I was supposed to be in Glorietta by one o'clock the next day to meet up with my youth group. And so my aunt, whom we were visiting, tells us not to panic. She would find a way. She found a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who was taking a group from Texas A&M over. And so she tells me, Leanne, this is way too much of a God thing. If something happens, you need to let me know. So of course I tell her, if I meet my future husband there, I'll let you know. Oh, well, okay, God has a sense of humor because that obviously happened. So So I had my ukulele with me, and as soon as I got there, I heard there was one other guy there with a ukulele. And I'm like, I'm going to track this person down. Two days later, my youth group and I are lost trying to find this event. We finally find the stupid activity. We do the stupid activity. I sit down, (laughs) exhausted. I look to my right, and there's a ukulele. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're the ukulele guy. And he's all shy and everything, but it starts to rain. And we all and there's lightning, so we all get shoved into this uh, cabin. And lo and behold, inside there is a piano. And Stephen is an absolute genius on the piano. Yes. So he takes, I can attest. Oh yeah. So he takes the piano. I take the ukulele. We sing Billy Joe McGuffrey from the Veggie Tales movie <laughs> to, to start off a jam session. And for the rest of the camp, like the rebels we are, we would sneak into the sanctuary after hours to play worship songs together. Oh, but, that's 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 very deviant there, sneaking yeah, into yeah. the worship center to play worship songs. We almost missed dinner a couple of times. We were just having so much fun with our friends playing worship music and like the rebels we <laughs> you were. You were already on a trajectory down the wrong path right oh, there. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and we've just been playing, we've been worshiping together ever since. Okay. Now, so, yeah. When was that? What year was that? 2019. Okay. All right. That's, um, yeah. So, so Stephen, um, you, you, you hit the jackpot and I Absolutely. think you said that. In fact, I think the first picture I saw of Leanne that you had posted, I think your comment was, I didn't know I was dating a model. <laughs> that's so, essentially what it boils down to. I don't know if you remember that picture, Leanne, but I think that's what he said. Oh, so, so sweet. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, but they've been friends of mine for a while. And, and um, now, what, remind me when you, y'all got married. It's, you said y'all been over there six years, right? Yes. We got married in July of 2018. Oh, no. 
Yeah, so okay, so then we met in 2014. Okay, that's, okay, that's yeah, that, that makes more right. sense. So we got married in 2018 in Tucson, Arizona, uh, yeah. and it was it, we were so blessed. It was only 101 degrees that day. Only. Only 101. A little cooler uh, than normal. However, the uh, the church uh, the church forgot to turn on the AC, so our poor cake was melting, and then this, the AC turned off. Halfway <laughs> that just means you have to have a fast wedding, so you can eat the cake oh, yeah. very, very quickly, <laughs> and, and you have to eat all the cake. So uh, exactly. That's the excuse. And, yeah, and then three weeks. later... Later, we moved to France. Yeah, that's okay. So that was a very quick transition. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I was just talking to Leanne. Uh, and so you didn't know any French at the time, right? No, I spoke Japanese. Yeah. Now, how did you learn to speak Japanese? So when I was five years old, I, uh, in Aris- I came home from kindergarten and I wanted to watch Tom and Jerry, but, Air Mer- but Arizona does not do daylight savings. Okay. So yeah. instead... A Sailor Moon, an anime was on, and I fell in love with Japanese stuff, and ever loved my entire life. And eventually, I just I I convinced my mom to let me study Japanese at the local community college while I was in high school. So I studied for two years. I go over there, and I and we go on a mission trip to serve the uh, the survivors of the tsunami in okay. the in the mm-hmm. Iwate Prefecture, which is in the northeast. And even two years later, there were so many people living in temporary housing that mm-hmm. the government had just swept under the rug. And so I went with my Christian theater group. We helped them out, and then we did a, and then we did some uh, theater ministry as well. Uh, but while I was there, I discovered the instrument, the ukulele. Oh. Then I get home, and God closes all the doors to Japan, and I can't figure out what's going on. God says to pause for dramatic effect. And the next summer, I find out that there's one other person at that camp with a ukulele. <laughs> and uh, a few years later, he uh, he's studying in France uh, at this language school for missionaries, and he's working with the 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 the, the pastor of the church in association with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy's a former opera singer, and okay. so he and Stephen put on this incredible of uh, Christmas concert that is a huge hit to the town. And so he says, hey, Stephen, you want to come over and be the worship director here? And he's like, hey, wow. Leanne, you want to come with? I'm like, eh, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and wow. so a reoccurring theme that we are going to hear is that the will of God, you know, it creeps up on us in very often humorous and unexpected ways. Yeah. And the calling that we may have had for a long time to serve him in a certain capacity, uh, it will s- surprise us often how that turns out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reminded of Apostle Paul saying that the gifts and callings of God are uh, irrevocable. And so, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, those, <laughs> and, and uh, I have to remind myself of that quite often too. So yep. uh, I think we all do at times. Uh, so when you said Japanese, my first thought was she watched anime at one point. <laughs> that's, that's what it boils down to. <laughs> right about it. Sure. Okay, so, so you, um, so what part of France are y'all in? So for the last six years now, we've been situated in a city called Albertville, which is in the southeast of the country. It's pretty far removed from Paris and all of the big metropolitan areas. Okay. But it's a town huddled up against the French Alps. It's about a couple hours from the border with Italy and Switzerland as well. So it's it's pretty far removed. It has a population collectively of about 45,000 people. No, excuse me, about 18,000 people for the city proper. Mm-hmm. And uh, we... Originally went there because there's a language school there mm-hmm. that specializes in training up um, English speakers in the French language in order to carry on uh, with their mission calling. Okay. It's often in French-speaking Africa, but it, it really could be the French-speaking world at large. Yeah. And so I felt a calling to go there to perfect my uh, French Initially with the intent of continuing ministry in Africa, which mm-hmm. is where my heart has been for a long time, but it was made pretty clear that the need for missions in France uh, is overwhelmingly strong yeah. as well. For a country of about 68 million people, we mm-hmm. only have about uh, anywhere between forty-five and 75,000 uh, active Protestant Christians in that country, which equals up to anywhere from a half to about one and a half percent mm-hmm. of the population. I think you're thinking uh, 350,000 350, to 400, yes, 470,000. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so in Albertville, that sounds like a place I would probably like to be more than Paris. Exactly. <laughs> the way you describe it, at least. So uh, uh, I've never been there. I've been to Paris several times. But uh, did y'all have to deal with any of the... 
uh, madness from the Olympics, all of the traffic and people, or, or was that was that mainly closer to Paris? Or was it's that... mainly closer to Paris and in several other cities around France. Uh, we're far enough removed from it, but either way, uh, the two of us ditched the country before to come okay. to the states before all that. We got out in was. time. We got out in time. Yes. However, yeah. our our town has had an influx of Parisians. Of in this, it's, there's this grand exodus of citizens, like people who live in Paris, trying okay. to get out for the Olympics. Yeah. And since our region is a ski center, and they, they people like to come over there to get to escape, so there was an influx of tourists from Paris. But other than that, we were untouched. Okay. All right. And so. Steve even the country you grew up in is a French-speaking country, I assume? Yes. Okay. All right. And it had, now, raised, being raised, uh, how long were you there all of your childhood life? Or did uh, when did you when did you come back to the United States? Between the countries of Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire, and then Burkina Faso, which is a, a small country mm-hmm. directly north of it. I was there uh, essentially for my entire childhood, okay, and really didn't spend any meaningful time in the uni- in the United States until mm-hmm. I started college at Texas Tech University, and it was really incredible to see God at movement there for so many years, and it provided an interesting perspective compared to what we have to deal with on the mission field in France, because in Africa and in so many places of the world, when you address the question of theology and Deism mm-hmm. and just the concept of there being a spiritual entity out there that's greater than us. Mm-hmm. So many, so many people are in, instantly at least open to the concept. Whereas in France, there is um, a sort of smugness and arrogance that's mm. been ingrained in the culture so yeah. long to the effect of um, once you even address the concept that you b- believe in the possibility of a spiritual realm, you're l- looked down upon. Yeah. And it's very difficult to enter into those kinds of conversations. Yeah. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. I, um, so for, uh, about six years I led worship for missionaries, kids retreats in uh, central and Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, so I would travel over to, um, we'd find a kind of centralized country, uh, about three or four times a year. And, um, uh, would lead worship. It was basically youth camp for missionaries' kids, and these were International Mission Board missionaries' kids, and um, uh, you know, uh, junior high and high school age. And um, there was about a hundred, maybe hundred kids that I worked with, and um, it, it was one of the greatest blessings of my life. And I remember the first trip I went on was to Greece, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get all the souvenirs I can get, and and then come home, and I'll never go back again. <laughs> and then I, that's when I got the bug, and so I started mm. seriously started thinking about missions. At one point, started thinking the Lord may be calling me to a uh, foreign mission field somewhere. He, he eventually made that clear that it was not what he was doing. He wanted me to be involved in missions in other ways, which, I, I mean, I believe that all Christians are called to missions in some capacity. Mm. That may not necessarily mean um, you know, mo- moving overseas or and anything like that there, but we are all called to, uh, to missions in some way. And so, uh, uh, but, but I did notice a difference, uh, in some of the countries that I went to, um, uh, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And, and I almost, the Western European countries I went to, I, I the way you said it, I think makes a lot of sense. I almost would call it like a, a post-Christian, uh, mm-hmm. culture and you know and, and in some so, ways yeah. it ends there's some of that all, honestly in eastern europe too but in some ways it made it uh, quite difficult for the families that i ministered with uh, that served there um i mean they would go sometimes years mm-hmm. without uh, a convert and yes. then and, and you know their goal was to start a church but for a long time, their family, that was their church in the town that they were serving. And, Absolutely. So, and so I saw that, whereas um, some missionaries, I told you about my friend that was serving in Chad, and mm. um, I've, I've talked to missionaries serving in other parts of the world where, I mean, they're just seeing people come to Christ left and right. And, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of these missionaries in Europe weren't experiencing that, which made it quite difficult. They yes. felt very isolated in some ways. Yes. And so there was, you know, that, that type of... Uh, um, sentiment among a lot of them so um so with you being in france um what are some of the difficulties that both of you uh face like what are some of the most uh, difficult challenge that you have there it's a very good question so initially to provide some context exactly what we do we found a bit of a niche uh in performing uh ministry outreach through the avenue of music 
We've already started uh, down the reoccurring theme of music, musical expression, mm -hmm. and we found out that for the two of us, actually, that's been the most powerful tool that the two of us uh, are equipped with in mm. order to evangelize. Because music really overcomes most of the biggest obstacles that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, it overcomes the of uh, the legal obstacles mm -hmm. of unlike here in the states during COVID when many churches were having open air services mm -hmm. that's completely off the table for us. Mm -hmm. Religion needs to be religious services and religious expression needs to be private behind closed doors mm -hmm. inside a specific building. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can't go on the streets and with a with a with a megaphone. It can't mm -hmm. it can't do that. Can't hand out tracks because those are associated with cults. Can't go door to door. That's okay. a huge faux pas. We can't even have outdoor services in, mm -hmm. in, in a public space. So if we mm -hmm. think back uh, to COVID confinement in 2020, in many parts of the world, like here in the United States, churches at least had the opportunity to have open air mm -hmm. services, mm -hmm. but that was not an option afforded to us. Mm -hmm. nope. I'm assuming that that is now, has that changed no. or is it? No, nope. it's really? actually gotten worse. Uh, there have there have been bills proposed to uh, require church of uh, all religions basically to se to send in their sermons before they preach them for approval. Really? Yes. Wow. Uh, and part of part of the struggle is that evangelicalism is considered a cult. It's considered mm. an American imported version mm. of Christianity. And so they already think that we're weird. They mm. uh, there's already heavy regulation on us. And they're heavily sensitive to uh, the French public is heavily sensitive to proselytism, mm -hmm. and but to the point where it's you know, where it's considered proselytism just to, in many cases just to say I believe this or I am a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel that intention. They feel that pressure needed to like. They, they feel like you're pressuring them to take to believe what you believe, oh. and so uh, one of our friends. Like their son, he just wore a Christian shirt to, to school, and he was asked to go home and change. It wow. gets, it's that strict. However, music uh, gives us almost a carte blanche uh, mm -hmm. to, to declare the name of Jesus in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, every year we put on a Christmas concert, and uh, we've discovered that the French love country music. Right. And they, they, they love it. Unexpected. Right? <laughs> uh, they you know, learned the dances, and uh, it's a grand old time. It's a hoedown. Uh, well, uh, the... the uh, uh, anyways, so <laughs> <laughs> and the same also applies to Christmas concerts. Yeah, what we found is that if we have the excuse to perform um, on a public stage through the guise of a cultural experience, because Christmas music can be considered a cultural expression from certain parts of the world, yeah. America, but even traditional. European music too and through that we're able to share the gospel through country music it's a cultural expression of Americana yeah. of American style music and we just inherently uh, have songs that speak gospel truths in those styles as well mm -hmm. it's like God placed you right in that position just for this uh -huh. <laughs> it's a uh, um, yeah that that's neat how you could take those tent maker opportunities and realize like <laughs> I've been learning this all my life just for this purpose so. exactly and so that gives and that gives us a context in which we can declare the name of Jesus in the public sphere, but in a way that makes people that doesn't turn people off immediately. Mm -hmm. A good friend of mine, her name is Sabine, and she's the organizer of many of the musical events in town. And she said that our Christmas concert was the first time she'd ever attended a religious event mm -hmm. without immediately feeling pressured to take on the faith. Mm -hmm. And it's thanks to that that she is now open to talking about faith. And we've had several incredible opportunities since. And she she was helped she offered to help me with our with our worship album. And yeah. she even and she eagerly wanted to listen to the music and look and learn about what I believe because of this testimony. Yeah. And even even from a political standpoint, we've faced a ton of a ton of obstacles from from the local government uh, over the last several years. Of but the pastor came to our church's 40th anniversary concert this year. The mayor. The mayor. Uh, but the mayor. No, oh, thank you. But the mayor came. But the mayor came to our 40th anniversary concert. And usually, political figures aren't supposed to touch these things with a ten and a half foot pole. <laughs> But he came and he said that he, he wanted to come because he wanted to tell us how how happy he is that our church is part of his community. Wow. That's, that's I mean, those are huge oh, steps. Yeah. They may seem like small steps, but in, 
in a situation like what you're describing, that those are pretty big steps. Yes, so, our testimony um, with the with the community and with the local government is paramount, and yeah. our in our testimony with our own churches as well, because many of these people are the only Christians that they know of outside of their church. Many, wow. uh, one of the ladies that came to Christ this year, her name is Noel. Half of her family thinks she's crazy. And uh, the only person daring to come into a church is her husband, who's trying to figure out this weird Jesus thing yeah. that his wife got into. Wow. So th- t- tell me about the, the local church uh, y'all are a part of there. Like, what's, uh, uh, what's that like? I mean, what's the... Um... So the small church that we attend, we've been designated in a way uh, the worship leaders and the music directors at this church... Uh, collectively, for people who attend on a regular basis, uh, we have about 50 people. And so that's for a town of 18, 20,000. And we're the biggest church in town. We are okay. one of two. Yes. That, <laughs> Which, uh, to put in perspective, what, what size would that be? Like, like um, the biggest church in, in Albertville, right? Yes. Okay, so, so, so what, what, what size is that Physically, the church is probably the size of an American standard living room, plus maybe an adjacent kitchen. It's a former de- either dentist office or physical therapy office. Okay. Yeah. So so I guess in a lot of American context it might be considered maybe a smaller church or Sure. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, just to just so, so you know people have a perspective on that. It's, you know, um, <laughs> this is not the United States, so it's, there are differences. So right. and so is this uh, affiliated with any particular denomination or is it like a non-denominational church? Or? We are so few and far between as far as believers go that we inevitably have to compromise yeah. on um, on our established titles. And so it is what we would consider a non-denominational church. Or maybe maybe a, a inter- interdenominational. Yes, yes, I got you. Okay. Yes. And the and the church has come up with some creative solutions to make sure that everyone's perspectives are represented. Mm-hmm. We have what's known as a président system or a presider system. Okay. And so we have the, so we in a sense have two sermons every every Sunday. You have the presider and the and the and the pastor. And the presider is chosen from a cycle through from from our council. They give a devotional and they choose the songs. Okay, and yeah, so, that, yeah, that's a good way to do it. Um, and and, and I, I think on the mission field in general, um, I, I just I, I wish uh, Christians broadly were more like this. But some if, keeping secondary issues secondary, and uh, I think I think we would find more unity in that if if everybody did that and. Um, you know, it, it, I, I'm not saying that people shouldn't have opinions, and and uh, certainly we should have opinions on theological issues. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't room for uh, some differences. And and uh, I, I I learned that when I was uh, uh, the seminary I attended for my doctorate. It was very diverse. Uh, every tradition you can imagine, and every I mean, uh, one third of the student body was from other parts of the world, and so. You know, I, I remember sitting in a class one day with this Anglican priest, and, and I looked over one day just in the middle of class, and it struck me. I was like, man, this guy, I think he probably loves Jesus more than me. <laughs> like he, you know, just you, you realize, like, you have these preconceived notions and, and secondary issues. Hmm. Uh, they just became more secondary to me. And, hmm. you know, like I said, I certainly have opinions on things, but they're not they're not deal breakers. And, um, and I think on the mission field, it's crucial to... Uh, if you're living in another culture, that that that's the case. That mm-hmm. that you know you you find unity where you can, and and um, uh, you know have your opinions, but they're realize they're secondary issues. And so I think that's really neat. That uh, my dad is a director of missions for an association of Baptist churches in um, in East Texas, and there's a church. If you drive through this small town, there. I mean, when I say small town, it's probably like a population of five and a dog or something. But it's like in the middle of the woods. And you drive by, and there is, it says, Weeches Baptist Church. And I don't know if it's still this way, but there used to be, at least, a United Methodist symbol on the sign. (laughs) And so I always thought, why? It says Baptist Church, and there's a United Methodist. Well, this this actually used to be pretty common in small towns and, you know, in in southern part of the United States. But... Mm. um, the Baptist and a Methodist churches in the community would meet in one building 
And I mean, it literally was two different congregations, right. but they all met together and they functioned together. They worshiped together. And so uh-huh. the, the Methodist pastor would preach one week and the Baptist pastor there would preach go. the next yeah. week. And, uh-huh. and they still, you know, they still operated according to their, uh, their theological standings. I mean, the Baptist uh, dunked and the Methodist sprinkle. I mean, they still did that, but mm-hmm. they met together and they, you know, they, they compromised. And so mm-hmm. I think that's uh, uh, something that a lot of, uh, Americans and uh, probably a lot of Christians in general could could learn to um, find unity where there is unity and and let the secondary issues be secondary. So I think that's great that y'all are doing that. Exactly, and something that we've really grown to appreciate of you know, about about French culture is that you can have your debates with people and still raise a glass to each other at the end. Yeah. And so we have people from you know, from Lutheran backgrounds, Huguenot, from all kinds of different backgrounds, and. They'll disagree. They'll have a discussion. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's an animated one. And we're all still brothers and sisters, and we'll have our potluck together at the yeah. end. And that's something I... With crepes, right? Yeah, we'll have our crepes, crepes at the end. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's really neat. I'm glad y'all are doing that. And, mm-hmm. and so are y'all both singing and leading worship at this church every week? Yes. Okay. Yes, the two of us perform music... Um, we're also tasked with organizing uh, um, other instruments and singers to join us up front, and it can most definitely be a challenge since we are so few and, and far between. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be difficult to find willing, warm bodies uh, to participate, but through this system that we've already describe to you, particularly from a musical perspective, it also means that we get to experience a wider variety of repertoires. Mm -hmm. And so when we first arrived, it really was uh, a matter of learning five or six new songs regularly every single week. Mm. But as a result, you just have a richness to the repertoire and to the musical expression, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. But in addition to just strictly leading music for church-related musical activities, whether it's Sunday morning service, our um, special activities such as Christmas concerts, we are also involved with writing music in French because we found that within the French Christian repertoire, which is already relatively limited compared to what we see in English music, Mm -hmm. I mean, it applies to secular music as well, of course, we just see such a massive and widespread industry on this side of the the pond which mm-hmm. has no basis of comparison to what's being done over there and so as, mm-hmm. as as a result we see a lot of the music that's used in the interest of praise and worship psalmology uh songs of praise and worship so many of which are actually translated from english mm-hmm. and it poses a number of obstacles one of which is the simple fact that just to, to translate uh, a song in that very specific kind of context, uh, it can with great difficulty attempt to communicate or convey the same message, especially when there's some theology involved. Yeah. So it can mm-hmm. be very difficult to do. So the two mm-hmm. of us have developed a heart to focus on writing um, church focused music in French, originally in French. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that that's amazing, and uh, I think most of the stuff I've uh, I've seen videos of of some of the stuff you're doing in church and stuff, and uh, most of the recordings that I've seen has been uh, Stephen, like your Christmas instrumental music and stuff like that. So I'm glad to hear that both of you are doing um, uh, something specifically for French speaking people there mm-hmm. in your part of the world. Um, that that can be used and applied in the context of the local church and mm-hmm. and you know yeah that you're right that is uh, um, I, I I've seen um, songs I mean rarely but I've seen some songs that have been translated from other languages into English mm-hmm. and you're right there is a mm-hmm. difficulty uh, especially when you're dealing with some theological matters that um, you know you're trying to convey mm-hmm. a truth that that song perhaps conveyed conveyed in that language that when it's translate it doesn't quite work out the same way so it doesn't so quite and i've discovered by by uh, taking part in the in like leading worship in several different cultures i've led worship at with my ukulele at a japanese hawaiian church i've was moved as part of the japanese church in, in japan uh in france and in several denominations here in the states and every single one has its own of uh, like 
worship link, uh, like literary heritage and, mm-hmm. expo- and poetic heritage that doesn't always translate much uh, even across subcultures much less across languages yeah sure so something like are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb that will not translate properly really? into okay. french uh, cuz of that that would raise that would probably raise ideas of like, that's not a concept that would be familiar it's, to okay it's one that would have different connotations okay. uh, we are talking about a country whose national anthem talks about watering the, the meadows of France with the blood of our enemies oh well so, okay it, <laughs> it's in reference to the French Revolution yes and that's the first thing that people will think of if they hear something like that and in a country whose re- religious history is so marked by violence we tend to it's wisest to avoid imagery like that uh, kind of it doesn't it doesn't have the same cultural of uh, the same cultural implications mm. and then you also have the trouble with linguistic uh, the, like just the linguistics of it yeah. because language is not just words plus grammar equals idea <clears throat> it's a whole new way of expressing an idea uh, and so a lot of these translations kind of sound like they went through Google Translate. Mm. And uh, we have the impression... They probably that, did. They probably, <laughs> probably did. did. Yeah. And we have the impression that the big churches want these songs to be easily recognizable from the, across languages. And unfortunately, it causes... Uh, it does a lot of damage to the poetry of the mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. My favorite example being Our God. Our God is greater, our God is uh-huh. stronger. Uh, it starts off in English, You, uh, water you turned into wine, you open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you. Uh, for, in the, for the line, you open the eyes of the blind, it's, uh, first things first, it's not grammatically correct. Okay. Uh, they ran out of syllables. So they, uh, then they use a... Hey, there's <laughs> English songs they do that with too. And sure. The first language, and they're still making I it. I know, right? It's still not grammatically correct. <laughs> And, and then they use a conjugation that is only used in a literary French. Mm-hmm. And, and then it translates directly to either you touch eyes with your hands or you touch the eyes of your hands. There's no one like you. Ah. Imagine this is your first week at yeah, church. Yeah, that's... It's not going over very well. Uh, and then when I translated to so sweet to trust in Jesus, my favorite line does not exist in the French language. There is no way to communicate that idea with in the French language. What's the line? It is of uh, it is um how I've proven I see of uh, how I the line is how I've proven him over and over. Okay. I can prove that Stephen exists by tapping him by by proving his existence. Okay. But I can't prove his character. I can't prove Stephen over and over. And so we had to find a whole new way to express that idea. Mm. And so what we and one of the top worship songwriters came up with, who happened to be wanting to translate this song too, and so we, we put our heads together to come up with a way to translate this thought. And uh, what, we came up, what we came up with is, My confidence finds in Jesus the saving hope that confirms it. In, in the language, it has like this upward spiral of a sense to it. Yeah. It's, and I promise you it sounds poetic in French. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm sure, and, and these are things that people probably often don't think about, <laughs> especially yeah. uh, when you're coming from another culture. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, I think, uh, it, listen, I, I, I think mission trips are great. I, mm-hmm. I think people, uh, Christians should Try to go on mission trips because sure. often they will. Ch- it'll change your life, you sure. know. Mm-hmm. Um, but to think that you're getting the whole picture on that would be a, a, a false, you know. You're you're um, to think that you can take your American culture to another culture and just place it there, and and it's mm-hmm. just going to work out. Uh, it's almost kind of a uh, an arrogant sense, you know. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and so it's that's that's not mm-hmm. at all. Uh, I think it's you know Paul says. Mm-hmm. I'm, become all things to all people and that's kind of mm-hmm. sort of the the idea there's probably some cultural norms that you, you two have had to uh, deal with where you've had to kind of maybe adapt or modify some yes. things too um it's really great that you bring that up because one of my favorite analogies is, is also from the apostle paul within the french culture i mean it's so easy to walk in there and to from the apostle paul who who tells us directly be bold in your declaration of, of the faith f- hear not and in all things proclaim with boldness 
and we're tempted to just do that in the most straightforward, efficient, effective way as we can, but um, the French culture does not work like that. In fact, if anything, we find more similarity between modern-day French culture and that of the ancient Greeks and Romans, who above all prioritized the... Uh, the f um, the f philosophy of debate and the importance of sitting down and actually debating on a philosophical level, mm -hmm. which is uh, at the very <clears throat> least going to be your foot in the door for that conversation. Yeah, we see how the apostle Paul, who was the same guy who said, "Speak boldly," but when he went to Athens and he saw all the idols around, instead of immediately going up and smashing the idols, he took time to reflect. He went to the marketplace. He sat down with people to debate with them. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, we find so many similarities with that with the modern day French people. A people who, above all, actually, they have uh, for themselves the utmost respect of philosophers. It is a people of the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It is a people meant to to philosophize, if I can say that, yeah. your way through life. Um, and so, just as the apostles have to, we have to meet them where they're at, and that's our starting place. That's our foot in the door. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I think um, it's not it's not perfect either. No. I mean, no, no. it's a learning experience. I mean, as in our sanctification process, we're we're being made more like Christ. But yeah. there's also as we're you know, especially someone who's on the mission field, as you're uh, learning your uh, you know the people that you are ministering to, and um, uh, you're figuring out you're sort of figuring out things along the way you know <laughs> and uh, you, you reminded me of apostle paul that that picture right there is on mars hill yeah uh where paul stood in act 17 mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i used to be skinny back in the day so that was uh <laughs> uh but i i was able to uh read some scriptures there but um i'm reminded of two that. chapters later acts 19 that's when he he says be bold yeah yeah <laughs> and in Acts 17 when he's preaching the sermon of the unknown god in athens mm -hmm. it didn't go well for him <laughs> and so <laughs> and so you know i i'm thinking of uh you know that yeah. as, as christians we we mm. it, it's interesting we can't be expected to be perfect no. but growing mm -hmm. and i think that's why that's um it's it's the word of god that is uh that is perfect and so right. uh you know, it, Scripture says that, that God uses the foolishness of preaching, mm. but when the Word of God is proclaimed, it does not return void. And so, Absolutely. so yeah, yeah, we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to get it right every time. But when you are uh, preaching the Word of God, when you are um, indwelled with the Holy Spirit, it's not going to return void. And so, I think that's a crucial thing to remember for anyone who's in any type of ministry setting, but especially on the mission field, just understanding that I'm not going to get this right every time. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning. These there are you know there are cultural differences, there are language barriers, there are all kinds of things that you have to deal with, and which is why you know I, I think maybe some people have an idea that that it's this glamorous you just get to live in another country and that's not what it is it's a it's a toil it's a work and um, mm -hmm. and so i'm thankful that you two are uh, actively involved in that and and yeah music is your your tent making opportunity but you are proclaiming the gospel mm -hmm. and so you know and and as we've talked about in a country like that um you know, it, it's it's work. It's a toil, yes, it and, and you, you might, you know, you're you're not in the ten forty window, and you're not you're not seeing people just come in droves. No. But which, in some ways, makes it a little more difficult. But mm -hmm. um, it's worth it, and mm -hmm. and so I'm thankful that you two are doing that. Um, and you. what's so wonderful about doing mm -hmm. worship is that, especially in the modern age, of uh, I mean, it's it's like the Roman road. It's like the Roman roads that carried the gospel throughout the entire the entire world where where Latin and Greek were, spoke, were spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, French is spoken all over the world, mm -hmm. and we have the Roman road of Spotify, Apple Music, yes. YouTube, and so we've already received uh, testimonies of the songs that we've written. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of the guys that helped me write of uh, a song based on Job, I, I know my Redeemer lives. It's mm -hmm. inspired by a song in English. But I know my redeemer they use. I wanted so bad to translate that song. It's by Natalie 
Cole? No, I can't remember her last name. Grant? Grant. Natalie Grant. Natalie, Natalie Grant, right? It's by, yeah, yeah uh, My Redeemer Lives by Natalie I haven't heard Nat- that in a long time, but yes, I know the song you're yes, referring Nat- to. Yes, My Redeemer Lives by Natalie Grant. It's a wonderful song. I wanted to translate it, but it just didn't fit with the French language. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a new song using the same, the same emotional movement and the same mm-hmm. ideas, and this guy helped me out with it. And, uh, I, and he caught up with me to say, Leanne, thank you so much for writing that song. Because I got to a point in my faith where all that was left of it was, but I know my Redeemer lives. Mm. And your song was with me through that whole period. Mm. Man, that's just powerful. Yeah. And that guy is back. He's more in love with the Lord than ever. Yeah. He's writing more worship music. Yeah. And we are bound and determined to do some collaborations with this guy. Yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Stephen, where's your beret? Leanne has a beret. I know. I am. Get with the you program. Mine, I'm not with the there. program. Yeah. <laughs> um, In fact, I, it's been a while now since I've even tasted a proper croissant. I think I'm going to start oh, going yeah, crazy yeah. here. I'm sure it's quite different there. I, I know when, uh, usually when I've gone to a place where they're known for a certain type of food, like a uh, gyros in oh, Greece yeah. or something mm-hmm. you kind of you get back and you're like yeah it's not the same it's you might find something that's somewhat good but it's not going to be the same you know exactly. the best crepe I ever had was right outside the Eiffel Tower there you actually. go mm-hmm. so, you know so I, I, I'll go order a crepe at IHOP I'll enjoy it but it's still not the same you know <laughs> <Nope>. so well <laughs> and so. coming back to the states it has its share of pleasures aside from the Ability to share some time with some old friends like Dr. Jones here. The ability to partake in some good Tex-Mex. Some oh, good yeah. Texas See, that's one thing yeah. you're not going to get in France. We will no. not you're not going to get that. Tex-Mex. No, sir. It is yeah. not the same. That's that's. I think every trip I've gone on, <laughs> I it's at some point when I'm about to return home, I just start craving Mexican food. It hits food. you. It's just oh, like yeah. there's something that's like, I'm going back and getting that's right. uh, roses or something. Yeah. I'm getting uh-huh. some Mexican food. I bring my own hatch green chilies. I bring oh, my own yeah, mole yeah. sauce. And like, it, it's, if it, even if you make it over there, the, the peppers just aren't as spicy. Yeah. And if you go to a Mexican restaurant, even if you tell them to make it the way they made it in Mexico, they're so used to a, to catering to the French palate yeah. that they'll just bring out a bottle of hot sauce for you and you can put it out yeah. and put it on there. Uh, we've this one Mexican restaurant just to give an example of how little representation of Mexican cuisine there is over there this rep, this restaurant had a discovery menu you can discover Mexican food and the meal of the day was a quesadilla was it was it good did you I try, didn't it? try it okay, I tried okay. the I got the tacos al, uh, the tacos al pastor oh okay yeah so okay. good okay so those were good yeah. yes those were good I I, I, I tend to think that. Usually, like, if you go anywhere outside the border of Texas, like, just uh-huh. don't eat the Mexican food anywhere. Sure. <laughs> just, just, yeah. just don't try it. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, tell me how, um, so, how are you supported, and how can people support you? We do appreciate you asking. So, we are under uh, a small little ministry called France Music Ministry. That's an umbrella of a of an IRS registered nonprofit called Little Church International okay. and we're kind of in a special situation in that we are entirely independently funded so, so we do not have uh, a sending church or mm-hmm. an official organization sponsor of any sort so each year we try to come back uh, to the to the US to see family, but also to raise support, to meet with individuals who believe mm-hmm. in what we do. And so if you search France Music Ministry, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, uh, and you'll be able to find the music uh, that we write on there. We're on iTunes and Spotify under a French band name we have called Relève. So if you type in R-E-L-E-V music, you can also go to relevmusic.com and find us there. And there are ways on there that you can find to reach out to us. Okay. That's we great. Have, but we'll give you the link for our GiveLify new okay. page. And as well as the Spotify and, and Apple Music and YouTube links for the album and our and the website for Relève Music. Yeah, if you'll give me that, I will include it in this uh, episode. And, and be, you know, uh, anybody listening can... Uh, and I'll spread the word as well. So that's uh, Thank yeah. That you. that's uh, um, I, I'm thankful for people like you. You know, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that you um, you're independent. And uh, you know, I've heard people say that missionaries must 
proceed from a sending church. And and something in the back of my mind has always said, no, not necessarily. That's not always right. Mm-hmm. And and I think you are proving that if God calls you to do something, um, do it. Don't mm-hmm. don't don't necessarily wait. I mean, if God's telling you to wait, that's so <laughs> then wait. But mm-hmm. don't necessarily wait for the right moment. I, I'm always when I think of missions and doing the work of God. Um, a lot of times we get this idea that um, that it's God's will if it works out. In, in other words, you know, mm-hmm. the finances are coming together. The the mm-hmm. situation, everything just kind of fell into place. That must mean it's God's will. And but I'm always drawn back to every time I think that. What do we do with so many times in Scripture? How many times did it work out? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, the, how many times did it make sense? That's we always think point. we always think if it makes sense, it's God's will. Mm-hmm. But did it make sense for Moses go part the waters? <laughs> <laughs> Abraham go to a land that I will show. What? What do you mean? Right. Where is it? Just go to the land that I will yeah. show you. You was, know, and you think. I mean, <laughs> Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah was. Uh, you know, it was lived lived a terrible life. I mean, sure. he, he was in, mm-hmm. uh, he was tortured. He was in prison. I mean, there were, there was so, the Apostle Paul. He lists the things he went through, yes. and, mm-hmm. and it's like there there are there are things that maybe if it's not making sense to the human mind. I mean, God's ways are higher than our understanding. Mm-hmm. Maybe if it's not making sense, uh, sense maybe that mm-hmm. is giving mm-hmm. us an indication that it's God's will, right. um, or mean- or it is a trial for us to be obedient, mm-hmm. even though. In our minds, it's not making sense. And so, um, and I'm not saying what you, you guys are doing is not making sense, but it, it, it just, it does go a little bit against the grain and I'm thankful for mm-hmm. that. And so that, that you follow the call of God and that you obeyed him. And so, mm-hmm. and you're serving him and you're seeing, you know, what you've told me here, you're, you're, you're starting to see some fruit and I think you'll continue mm-hmm. to see fruit. So at the beginning, when most people, to most people, when we tell them that we're missionaries in France, it doesn't make sense to them. And we just followed the call over there and found ourselves in a mission field as, uh, with, uh, in, a fish, in a mission field as barren as many of the places that Stephen grew up in in Africa. Mm-hmm. And so when you follow, it, if it doesn't make sense, if, it often doesn't make sense at first. <clears throat> but when you follow God, it's, it's like pausing for dramatic effect. Wait for the punchline. Follow yeah. God and it'll make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of... Um... The story of uh, Joseph in Genesis. I, mm-hmm. it, a couple years ago, this struck me. Um, when you read about Joseph, it, it takes up a good portion of Genesis, and mm-hmm. you know we all know the story of him being sold and then um, sold into slavery. Eventually, becomes second in command in Egypt, and everything focuses on on Joseph, mm-hmm. and it's Joseph this, Joseph that, Joseph, 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 mm-hmm. and and. I, I'd read that story, knew that story for years. I mean, it's, I think it's like 13 chapters in Genesis. It's a long portion of scripture. And um, I, I, I always thought, well, Joseph is the focus of this story. Joseph is, Joseph is the reason for this story, hmm. but he's not. He's and not. we don't ever think about this, but it was Judah. Hmm. And Judah is yeah. barely mentioned, <laughs> but through his line, the Messiah Jesus would come. And so, you know, right. I, mm-hmm. I'm reminded that sometimes in our work with our work for the Lord, you know, it may be that, you know, we're not we're not preaching before thousands of people. We're not giving concerts at the United Supermarkets Arena. We're sure. not, you know, maybe we're doing something smaller, but maybe maybe it's because God has us to be a Judah rather than a Joseph, you know. And so, right. and which which I mean, you look at. The Messiah came through jo- uh, Judah, which yes. was the and Joseph's purpose in being second in command in Egypt was to preserve the life of Judah, and um, so you know um, wherever the Lord sends you, wherever y'all are, I think right now you're where where you need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, don't get discouraged. Uh, uh, press forward. Keep going because you. you're, do, you. you're doing a very good work. Um, and and I'll just I'll just close with this. I, I'm reminded of um, uh, I was. Not long after I went to Greece on my first uh, mission trip, I got back and there was a there was a guy preaching at a local church, um, and he was preaching on missions. And he started the sermon off. He said, "I'm going to start a I'm going to um, start a verse, and I want everyone to finish it." And he said, "Be still," and um, and we all collectively in the congregation we all said, "And know that I am God," and then. Some other people like mumbled something else, and I was just like, "Like these people don't know this verse." And he mm-hmm. said, "I'm gonna try this one more time." He said, "Be still." We all said, "And know that I am God." And then 
at that point, several other people muttered something. I'm like, man, these people really don't know this verse. And and he said, he said, most of you only said a portion of the verse. It's be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations. Mm. And and we always miss that. And mm. and so it's you know, and he continued to preach on missions, but God's the the point was God's heart is for for people, for all people, and. Um, you know, I believe a day will come where all peoples, uh, tongues, and tribes uh, have heard the gospel. Um, does that mean doesn't mean everybody will respond, but but at least everybody will have heard the gospel and mm-hmm. had that opportunity. And 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 you two are a part of that right now. And Thank so, um, and, and honestly, in a um, a difficult part of the world. And so, um, as you know, most people don't think about it. They think, oh, it's France. It's glamorous and but ministry there is tough and so uh, press forward keep doing what you're doing and i'm thankful for both of you um anything else you want to add we just really appreciate what you are doing uh through this ministry to dr jones the faithfulness that you have to share what the lord has imparted with you not just through your studies but through what the spirit has to say too and i just encourage you to keep going because it is crucial what you're doing here with this podcast as well so well thank mm-hmm. you both thank you for being here this is Stephen and leanne abbott and um i i'm going to have the uh links that you give me um if you want to want more information on their ministry and what they're doing in france if you want to give to their ministry um thank I, you. I will have that linked uh, on this podcast on this episode so Uh, Thank you both. Thank you for joining me. We really appreciate you having us. Well, thank you everyone for listening to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones.